turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and once you've found Matthew chapter 7, I want you to put your finger or a bookmark or whatever it is that you might have in your Bible. Put it there in Matthew chapter 7, and then turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 6. Somebody say it with me. Matthew chapter 7, Luke chapter 6. And this morning we are going to begin a series entitled The Blessed Life. Somebody say The Blessed Life. How many of you want your life to be blessed? Amen. How many of you know somebody whose life is blessed? I mean, you just kind of look at them and you say to yourself, man, everything he touches turns to gold. It seems like every decision he makes is blessed. It seems like he can't make a mistake, but what God blesses it anyway. Do you know somebody like that? How many of you would like to be that person? Now, I have a question for you this morning, and the question that I have, and we were talking about it in, uh, in, in leadership team, and, uh, and, and, uh, and we're discussing this, this subject, we're discussing the message, and, and, and I said, you know what I would have liked to have done would have been to gone, gone downtown uh, in the old market or someplace like that and asked the question, what do you think a blessed life looks like? And wouldn't it be interesting to go to the mall and just you know, go to the food court and say, hey, you know, while you're eating your soft taco, let me ask you a question. What does a blessed life look like? You'd probably get all kinds of answers, right? Let me ask you this morning. What does a blessed life look like to you? If I were to ask you, what does a blessed life look like? Rick, what would you say? Prosperous and in good health. I like that. Don, what would you say? Fulfilling your mission. Fulfilling your mission. That's interesting. I probably wouldn't have got that down at Oakview. Fulfilling my mission. Uh, Demperus, what does a blessed life look like to you? When, when I say a blessed life, what comes to your mind? Obedience to the Lord. Obedience to the Lord. That's good. I like this. A bunch of holy people in this place. <laughs> Uh, Donovan, Donovan, right? Donovan, well, if I were to ask you, <laughs> this guy's like 15 years old, oh man, he had to ask me. If I were to just, just, just what comes to your mind? Just whatever it is. Oh, that's good. Look at this, 15 year old. He knows what a blessed life, able to go day by day without worrying about anything. What about? For a peaceful life. A peaceful life. So we've got a peaceful life. We've got going day, uh, day by day, not having to worry about anything, about fulfilling your God-given mission. Uh, what did you say over here? Prosperous. Prosperous and in good health. I thought about, uh, about what this subject uh, matter is, and I thought to myself, I, I think probably most people would say something like good health. You know, I mean, when we picture ourselves, you know, this is, this is what we picture, you know. Doing the downward dog, or whatever that thing is called. So it's, you know, picturing ourselves in good health. I think good health would probably be on everybody's radar, right? I think if we have our health, we know that we're blessed. If we don't have our health, we sure wish we did, right? And so I think, I think good health is part of it. I think most people would probably say having enough money. Come on. I can't remember who said it, but the, there, there was somebody who once said, I've been, I, I, I've been poor and I've been rich. Rich is better. <laughs> I don't know. And, and, and so I, I think, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think that looks like it's blessed. Amen? Amen? How many of you, you would like that to be your hands? Amen. And so good health, I think having enough money, I think good relationships. Right? I think having a good marriage, I think having, ha- having our, our children that are happy, our, our, our family that, you know, I mean, I think everybody would look at their family and say, yes, if, if, if my family looked like that, I would consider myself blessed. So good health, having enough money, good relationships. How many of you would, would have said a nice home? Anybody in this place or is it just me? A good home. Well, that's, that's a really good home. 
But having a, having a nice home or uh, perhaps having a nice car, right? Right? At least one that doesn't break down every, 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 few, every few, you know, nice, nice, nice GT or, or, or whatever it might be. Nice Range Rover. I know there are a bunch of Range Rovers out there, so you're all best. But, uh, but, but I think those are some of the, some of the things that I think that immediately come to mind. But how many of you know you can have nice cars and not have a blessed life? You can have all kinds of money and not have a blessed life. You can have your health and not have a blessed life. So I think all of these things are elements of a blessed life. But when we talk about a blessed life, let me tell you what a blessed life is. I'm going to give you the definition of a blessed life and what, what I think a blessed, it means to have a blessed life. Here's what it means. It means to have supernatural power working for you. It means to have the favor of God. It means to have God for you and not against you. It means to, to, to have all things work together for the good because you love God and are called according to his purpose. Are you with me this morning? Now, I look throughout the Bible, and as I look throughout the Bible, there's blessings all over the place. Have you noticed that? Have you ever counted the times the Bible uses the word blessed? I didn't go through the entire Bible, but did you know that the, that, that the Bible uses the word blessed 287 times. That's a lot of blessing. See, the Bible says in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, and after he created Adam and Eve, you know what the Bible says? That he blessed them. He said, be fruitful and multiply. One of the very first things that God did in his relationship with man is that he blessed them. The Bible says after that, there was a guy by the name of Abraham. And the Bible says that God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And in through you, all nations on earth will be blessed. I mean, if you begin to take a look at Abraham's life, not only was Abraham blessed. See, see, if you read just in Genesis, where that word blessed is used, you'll find that the next time it's blessed, there's a guy by the name of Abimelech who was Abraham's servant, who was looking for a wife for Abraham's son Isaac. And he comes to Rebekah's house, and he speaks to Rebekah's father, and he says to Rebekah's father, he says, God has greatly blessed my master Abraham. He said, God has blessed him with men servants and maid servants and silver and gold and camels and donkeys and, and sheep and cattle. And he goes down throughout the list because God has blessed this man. Some say, God bless the man. How many of you know God bless the man? God wants to bless you too. Because Abraham's the father of faith and he is the prototype of the believer. Are you getting this? Abraham not only was blessed, but Isaac was blessed. The Bible says that after Abraham died, Isaac came on the scene, and, and there's, a, there's a scripture in Genesis, and in fact, it's in Genesis 25. The Bible says, it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. Genesis 26 says, Isaac sowed in the land, and in that same year received a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. What's a hundredfold blessing? Can I tell you what a hundredfold blessing is? I know when we think of a hundredfold blessing, we think, I sow one and I get a hundred. That's not a hundredfold blessing. That's a hundred times blessing. You know what a hundredfold blessing is? You take the one you have and you fold it over. You open up that paper, you have how many sections? Two. You take that, that, that say and you fold it over and you open up that paper. You've done that twice. How many sections do you have now? Four. You take that section, you fold it over again. You've done it three times. How many sections do you have now? Eight. So it's compounded blessing. You know what a hundredfold blessing is? A hundredfold blessing is one times ten to the thirtieth power. You say, you say, you say, I, I don't understand that, that, that kind of a number. Neither do I. But I know that God can bless like that. How many of you would like to be blessed like that? And the Bible says Abraham was blessed. The Bible says Isaac was blessed. The Bible says Jacob was blessed. And Jacob not only was blessed, but he blessed Joseph, and he blessed Joseph's sons, and he blessed all the tribes of Israel before he went off the scene. Because, listen, God wants to bless you not just with enough blessing for you. God wants to bless you with enough blessing to bless everybody around you. Hallelujah. Oh, come on now. And the Bible says 
in, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and this is the same people, here's what God says. It goes on to say, if you obey God. Some say, if you obey. obey. How many of you know the blessing of God, the, the, the promises of God are contingent upon obedience? The promises of God are contingent upon obedience. See, when God comes and gives you a promise, there are conditions with the promise. God, throughout Scripture, says, if you do this, I will do this. If my people, which are called, then I will pour out my spirit. Are you with me? And so... Here's what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 28. He says, if you obey him, you will be blessed. Some say, I'm going to be blessed. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you're going to be blessed. Now, here's how he wants to bless you. If you obey him, he said, you will be blessed in the city and in the country. Your children will be blessed. Your crops will be blessed. Your livestock will be blessed. Your herds will be blessed. Your basket will be blessed. Your bread bowl will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in, and you'll be blessed when you go out. Your enemy is going to come at you one way and flee before you seven ways. He, he's going to bless your barns. He's going to bless your workplaces. He's going to open up the windows of heaven to bless you. You're going to lend and not borrow. You are going to be the head and not the tail. You're going to be above and not beneath. You are going to be blessed. Hallelujah. My Lord, I don't know about you. I want some of that. Somebody say, I want some of that. Now, see, God has a lot to say about the blessed life. And to be blessed means to have the supernatural power working for you. Now, in contrast, to be cursed means to have supernatural power working against you. I don't know about you. I don't want supernatural power working against me. I want supernatural power working for me. Amen. 1984, true story. A young evangelist by the name of Robert Morris went to preach in a small church in the state of Oklahoma. As he came to preach in this small church, it was the only message he would preach that entire month. It was the only invitation he received. Now, as traveling as an evangelist, I know where he was. Because as an evangelist, when you go and when you preach, what you get is what you get. You're not, you're not pastoring a church. You're not on staff somewhere. If, if, if you're not preaching and you're not ministering, nothing's coming in. And so that particular month, he only had one meeting. A little tiny church in Oklahoma. He went to this meeting. He preached. Unfortunately for him, or fortunately later on they would find out, there was a missionary as well that had come to do a 10-minute window. So the missionary did his 10-minute window. They received an offering Brother Robert preached. At the end of his message, they received an offering. Service was over. Pastor came out, handed him a check. And he said, he said Robert, I just want to let you know, this is, the largest church, this is the largest offering our church has ever given to anybody. And we just want to know that you blessed us today. Robert said he found himself alone in the, in the foyer, and he opened it up, and he looked at it, and it was exactly what he needed to meet every bill that he had that month. Isn't that awesome? As he was looking at that check, he looked in through the double doors, down the aisle at the, at, at the missionary who was gathering his stuff together. And as he looked down that aisle and saw the missionary, the Spirit of God said, give him your offering. He said, I told the devil to get behind me. He said, but I knew it was the Spirit of God. I knew it was God speaking to me. He said, I tried to close my ears. I tried to argue with God. I tried to talk God out of it. But the more I tried to talk God out of it, the, the stronger the impression came. He said, so finally, I took that check. I endorsed it. I walked down the aisle. I gave it to the man, and I left. He said the preacher had invited him to come out and eat some pizza afterwards before they left town. So they went out to pizza, wherever it was, Pizza Hut. Where, and, and, and he said he was sitting at one end with the guys. His wife was sitting at the other end with the ladies. He said and across the table was a well-dressed man who looked at him. He said asked him the strangest question that anybody had ever asked him up till that point. Looked at him and he said, how much was your offering? Listen, I've been an evangelist. Nobody has ever asked me how much the offering was. He said he looked at him and he said, how much was your offering? Brother Moore said, it was good. He said, 
The, 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 the well-dressed man looked at him and he said, let me see it. He said, as a preacher, all of a sudden I found myself lying through my teeth. And he said, my wife has it. Man looked at him and said, go get it. True story. He got up, walked down to the other end of the table, got on his knee, whispered in his wife's ear, how's the pizza? He said, my wife looked at me like, good. You moron. What what am I supposed to say? He said, he got up and he said, and he muttered something on his way back. He said, he sat down and another lie went through his teeth. He he said, uh, it's out in the car. He said, and as he said it, he made it sound like it's way out across the parking lot in the car. The guy looked at him and the guy said, no, it's not. He said, it's not? He said, no. He said, the Spirit of God told me that you gave the offering to the missionary. He said, God is about to bring you into a new ministry. And he's going to bring you into a supernatural revelation of what it means to give and be blessed. He said, and this is just the beginning. He reached in his his vest pocket. He took the piece of paper, slid it across the table. And as he slid it across the table, Brother Morris said he opened it up and it was exactly to the penny, 10 times the amount that he had just given to the missionary. He said that was the beginning of an 18-month period in which they gave away nine vehicles. They were able to begin to give 70% of their income. You see, as he gave that away, he was in a, in, in a prayer meeting a little while later, and there was a young lady that was going to the mission field, and she needed $800 to go, and God just laid it upon their heart to give the $800. So they gave the $800, and as they gave the $800, they just, they, they just knew that it was, it was God beginning to lead them down this, down this path. They were with a man just the next day. And as they were with this gentleman, they went out to eat with him. And uh, as they were going to eat, the man picked him up in his brand new van. They were going to eat, and uh, they began to comment on how nice the van was. And after they ate, they were on their way back home. They got home, and the man said, will you help me clean out my van? So they helped him clean out his van. And as they were unloading that last box, uh, box, Brother Morris said, do you need this umbrella? He said, yeah, I need the umbrella because it's not my van. And, and Brother Morris said, what do you mean it's not your van? He said, the Spirit of God told me while we were eating dinner that I'm to give you the van. He said it was paid off, no strings attached. He blessed them with the van. They got blessed with a van. The very next day, they found out that somebody needed a car. Their old station wagon wasn't much, but they gave them the station wagon. No sooner had they given them the station wagon, somebody else gave them a different car. They gave away that car. Someone else gave them another car. They gave away that car. Someone else gave him another car. When it was done, in a period of 18 months, they gave away nine vehicles. They were able to give 70% of their income. And when they had, he felt, okay, God, we've given given away all of our vehicles. We've given away 70% of our income. We're able to live on 30%. God, You've taught us all about giving. Now I can teach the body of Christ that you cannot outgive God. God, I think I've done it. And the Spirit of God says, I want you to give away your last two vehicles. Give away the new van. Give away the car that somebody just gave you. I want you to give away all the money in your bank account. And I want you to give your house away. He said, God, okay. And so he did. He gave away both his vehicles. He gave away every cent in his, in his checking account, his bank account, and he gave away his house. And then he said as he was sitting in the house that he had given away, getting ready to move out, he was sitting on the couch thinking, okay, God, I've finally done it. I've finally outgiven you. Lord, there's no way that you can, you, you can top that. He said no sooner was he thinking that thought when he received a phone call. True story. He received a phone call from a man who said, I want to provide you with transportation. He said, okay. 
Transportation, I can handle transportation. We just gave away both our vehicles. He said, he said I want to give you a plane. He said, a plane? He said, yeah, I want to give you a jet. And I want to pay for the hangar. I want to pay for the fuel for the jet. I want to pay for the insurance on the jet. I want to pay for the maintenance on the jet. And I want to hire a pilot. I'll pay his salary. Anytime you want to go somewhere, just call him and he'll fly you anywhere you want to go. And he said, he hung up the phone and the Spirit of God said, gotcha. <laughs> How many of you know you can't outgive God? How many of you know to be blessed means to have supernatural power working for you? How many of you would like to have some of that kind of supernatural power working for you? Well, today we're going to take a look at the Word, and, and, and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about this supernatural power working on behalf of God's people. And so today, I want to speak to you upon the blessed life, and the first message we're going to, we're going to talk about is it's all about the heart. Some say it's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, if you're there, say, I'm there. If you're ready, say, let's go. Matthew chapter 7 says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Let me say that again. I love this verse. Judge not that you be not judged. Somebody say that with me. Judge not that you be not judged. Now look at the very last point or the very last line of that. It says, it shall be measured to you again, right? For with what measure, some say with what measure? You meet. What does that mean? With what measure you give, it shall be measured to you again. Now let me ask you the question to, uh, this morning. What is the subject of Matthew chapter 7? Judgment. Some say judgment. It's not a trick question. The subject of Matthew chapter 7 is judgment, right? <laughs> Thank you for the one right. Yes, amen. Let me, do I have to convince you? Let me, let me emphasize the word judge, okay, and, and see, if you, see if you'll get it. Judge not, that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. What's the subject? Thank you. Now, this morning, as we, as, as we look at the word, there's a parallel scripture. And the reason I'm bringing it out is to prove a point. It's found in, in Luke chapter 6. Some say Luke chapter 6. Now, 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 before we go to Luke chapter 6, here's what I want us to do. I want us to, com to commit to short-term memory, if we can get back to Matthew chapter 7. Let's commit to short-term memory, that first phrase and this last phrase. Somebody say it with me. Judge not. Judge the last phrase, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured again. So what are we committing to short-term memory? Judge not. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured again. Right? Are you with me? Now, let's look at Luke chapter 6. Judge not. Right? What's, what's, what's down here? For with the same measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Great verse. But look, here's what it says. Judge not, you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, Running over shall men give into your bosom. For with what the same measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, here's the problem with this verse. The problem with this verse, and let me just ask you a question. What's the subject? Judgment. Subject is not giving. But we preachers, and I've been guilty of it, use this verse to talk about giving. Right? And the problem with this is normally preachers use this scripture to talk about giving, and not only to talk about giving, but to talk about giving in order to get. Can I tell you that God is the author of giving? I mean, who thought it up? God thought it up, right? Now, 
let's pretend you and I are in the mind of God. And we're in the mind of God, and God is thinking up this thing called giving. And he says, you know what? I'm going to give. I'm going to give because I want to give, because giving is my nature, because giving is who I am and what I'm all. And I'm going to teach my children to give, and I'm going to teach my children to give so that my children can learn to get. How many of you know that that's not the motive for God teaching us to give? The motive for giving should never be to get. The motive for giving should always be to give. Are you with me? Now, can, is, this, is this scripture about money? Somebody say no. Somebody in the balcony say no. Okay, it's not about money. It's about judgment, right? But it's not just about judgment. It's also about condemnation. And it's about forgiveness. And it's about whatever it is that you give, right? You see, this, this morning as we look at that, the verb there is give, right? Give, give, give. That's the action word. The subject is you or, or it. It shall be given. The implied subject is you. So the verb is give. The subject is it. The implied subject is you. Now, now as we look at this, we need to understand that it could apply to money because whatever it is is what you're going to get. Now this is a terrible verse because here's what it says. Not only are you going to get it, but you're going to get it pressed down, shaken together, running over are men going to give to you? Now, 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 can I say to you, if you give judgment, that's the way you're going to be judged? My Lord, you're going to get back more than you give. If you give condemnation, you're going to get back more than you give. If you give grief, you're going to get back more than you give. But if you give forgiveness, you're going to get back more than you give. If you give love, you're going to get back more than you give. If you give mercy, you're going to give back more than you give. You see, it's a great verse, and it's a terrible verse. Are you with me this morning? Now, as we look at this subject, it's all about the heart. We see that the problem is that preachers preach this, and they teach people to give to get. And it's not given to give or it's not given to get, it's given to give. Are you with me? Now, in Deuteronomy 15, some say Deuteronomy 15. I want, you to, I want you to turn there with me if you've got your Bibles. Because can I say something to you? I'm going to shock some of you this morning, especially after everything I've said. Because I really, I really kind of set you up when I talked about everything that this guy got. And your eyes just got bigger and bigger. And you just went, oh, God, bless me like that. Well... We don't understand everything he went through, but, but as we look at this, can I, let, let me shock you. God doesn't bless giving. Say it again, because some of you didn't get it. God does not bless giving. He blesses giving with the right heart. Let me say that again. He blesses giving with the right heart. Deuteronomy chapter 15, let's take a look at it. God is telling his people to help the poor. Some say help the poor. And in doing so, he says, you're going to help yourself. Look at it. The Bible says, if there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in the land in which the Lord your God gives you, what is he saying? Thou shalt not harden thine heart. Some say thine heart. Circle the word heart if you've got a, if you, if you got a pencil and, and, you, and you've got uh, a, a, a regular Bible, not an electronic one. Somebody say, thy heart, nor shut thine hand from thy brother, but thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wants. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, some say heart, there's the word heart again, saying, in the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye shall be evil against thy brother, and thou givest him nothing. He cries unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto you. 
Thou shalt surely give him and thine heart. Some say heart. There it is again. Shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy work. Some say bless thee. There it is. And in all that thou put thy hand to do. How many of you would like God to bless you in everything you put your hand to do? Now look at this, verse 11. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in the land. Now there are four things we see here that we need to do in order to live a blessed life. Let me, t- let me, let me give them to you. Number one, deal with a selfish heart. Some say deal with a selfish heart. Here's the second thing, deal with a grieving heart. Not only do you need to deal with a selfish heart, you need to deal with a grieving heart. The third thing is you need to develop a generous heart. And then finally, you need to develop a grateful heart. Some say, first of all, deal with a selfish heart. Look at verse 9. Four things we need to do in order to live the blessed life. Number one, deal with a selfish heart. Look at verse 9. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart. Some say wicked heart. See, God equates selfishness with wickedness. Oh, my. Come on, you parents. Look at your child and say, selfishness is wickedness. Because how many of you know our children, they're born selfish? I was watching Nemo. You ever see Finding Nemo? I was watching Finding Nemo just last night. I didn't have my grandchildren with me. I was on my own. (laughs) But the reason I was watching it is because there's this part in Nemo where these seagulls are on the dock. You remember that part? And I think it's Dory and, and, and Nemo. They jump on the dock, and, and, and the seagulls are going, what? Mine, 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 mine. And every time I see that, it reminds me of children. How many of you know children don't have to be taught how to say mine? That's the only word they develop totally on their own and say it perfectly. Mine. Mine, 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 mine. I almost, I almost got that video to show you today, but I thought, ah, no. They, they'll know what I'm talking about. See, here God comes and God says, hey, beware that there's not an evil thought, a wicked thought in your heart. For when the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and your EB, I be evil against your, your, your poor brother, that you don't give him anything, and he cried to the Lord against you, and it be sin unto you. What is he saying? Here's what he's saying. Back in the Old Testament, every seventh year, All debts were erased. How many of you would like to reinstitute that program? Every seventh year, all debts were erased. Now, here's the deal. (laughs) There's always got to be one in the crowd. Brother, I work alone. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. He's, He's referring to the fact that maybe we're in the seventh year. Or maybe we're in the sixth year, right? And we know that the seventh year is coming up. And somebody comes to us and somebody says, man, I'm, I, I'm really in some, 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 some hard times. And I, I've hit some dire straits. And, and, man, I really need to borrow some money. Can you lend me some money? He said, don't let a wicked heart determine whether or not you're going to lend that man the money. Saying to yourself... Uh, there's only six more months left. And after six months, he's not going to have to pay me back. No, I don't think I'm going to lend him any money. And what does God say? God said, hey, look, you need to be sensitive to your brothers. And don't be selfish and don't be greedy. And so God says, look, if you're going to be blessed... You're going to have to deal with that attitude and deal with that selfishness. How many of you know we can be selfish? Heard a story of, a guy, of three guys that were stranded on an island. These three guys were stranded on the island. They looked out on the waves, and, and this wave brought in this, this, this bottle with a note in it. Guy ran out there. He grabbed the bottle. He opened up the note, and it said, If you'll rub this bottle, a genie will come out, and you'll receive a wish. So he rubbed the bottle, and... <laughs> There's the genie. The genie looks at all three of them. He says, I'm here to give each one of you a wish. The first guy goes, man, I miss home. I miss my family. I just want to be home. (laughs) He's home. The other guy says, 
I miss all my friends. I haven't been home in years. We've been stranded on this place forever. I want to go home too. I want to see my friends. <laughs> He's gone. Jeannie looks at the third guy and he goes, what would you like? He said, wow, now that my friends are gone, man, this place is really lonely. I'd like to have my friends back. <laughs> How many of you know selfishness isn't good for anybody? Hello? <laughs> so somebody say deal with a selfish heart. Number two, deal with a grieving heart. Somebody say deal with a grieving heart. Deal with a grieving heart. What, what's, the, what's the Bible say in verse 10? It says, thou shalt surely give him, talking about the, the poor guy, thou shalt surely give him. Look, there are people that come, come to us all the time, and, and they need something. And in fact, well, I, I'm not even going to, but it could be easy for us to look at people and go, you know what? You're a bad investment. And God says, look, don't look at them as a bad investment. Look at them as a spiritual investment. So we need to deal with a selfish heart. Deal with a grieving heart. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved. Some say thine heart shall not be grieved. Grieved. There's the word grieved. When thou givest to him. Because that, for this thing, the Lord thy God shall bless thee. He says, if, you, if you're going to give to the poor, don't give, be unselfish and give to him. Don't give grudgingly. And if you'll give with the right heart, I'm going to bless you. In all your works, in that everything you sit, set your hand to do. How many of you know we can grieve over money? Have you ever lost money? And it just made you sick? Oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe I loaned her the money. And I knew she wasn't going to pay me back. I should go just give her a piece of my mind. I should go lay hands on her. I'm going to get my money one way or another. I take it out of your flesh. You ever give to the Lord and something breaks down at home? You come to the Lord and you give this great offering and you feel good and, and you go home and all of a sudden the dishwasher breaks down. All of a sudden you get a flat tire. All of a sudden you, 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 you've got a need that right. And, and you think to yourself, I shouldn't have gave so much. You ever do that? Come on now. And we and we begin to we begin to grieve, and here he says, "Listen, listen. Selfishness attacks us before we give. <laughs> See, it's before we give. Selfishness says, don't give, don't give, don't give. After we give, grief attacks us. Now, why is it that the devil hates giving so much? Can I tell you why it is the devil hates giving so much? Because every time we give to the kingdom of God, people get saved. Come on now." Every time we give to the kingdom of God, people get saved. That's why the devil doesn't want us to give. Come on. I just had this thought. We're going out to eat. If we're going out to eat, I don't have any money. And uh, <laughs> Wow, man. Don, this is 50 bucks. Don, are you sure you're not going to regret this later on? <laughs> you're sure you're not going to grieve over this money that you just gave, Pastor? Yeah, yeah. I know you're not going to grieve over this money, see, because I, I gave him the money before the service. <laughs> oh, yeah, you've been set up. But I guarantee you, Don will never grieve over this 50 bucks. Why? Because you're not giving anything. It wasn't yours. I gave it to you before the service. And so you're just returning it to me. You're happy to return it to me. You got up. Yeah. <laughs> came on down, gave it with a big smile. He's still smiling. He's going to be smiling all day. He'll be smiling all week. He'll be smiling all year. When he thinks about this, he'll still be smiling a year, years from now. Why? Because the money he gave me, he didn't give me. He returned it to me. And he's not going to grieve over it because it wasn't something that he gave me in the first place. It was already mine. You know the reason many people grieve after they've given to the Lord? is because they don't realize that everything they have is already his. And if they realized it was already his, there would be no remorse. There would be no grief in giving. They would, they would gladly come and say, God, hallelujah, I'm glad to give you back which is already yours. Amen. 
Oh, come on, that's, that's better preaching than your amen in this morning. Somebody said, that's a good illustration. Amen, amen. Let's move on, let's move on. So you need to, you need to deal with a grieving heart. Somebody say, deal with a grieving heart. Deal with a selfish heart. De- develop a generous heart. Look at verse 14. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. See, folks, we need to get to the place where giving doesn't intimidate us. Where giving doesn't turn us off, but it excites us and it motivates us. You know, it, it excites me to be able to give. It excites me to be able to build an orphanage in Haiti. That excites me. It excites me to know that we're taking kids off the street and we are going to train them in the things of God and they are going to impact their nation for the glory of God. That excites me. It excites me to think about reaching out to people that are in bondage and in slavery. It excites me. It excites me to give to the Lord. Amen? It excites me to build a church in Africa. It excites me. And it ought to excite every one of us in this place. Matthew 6, 21. Have you ever read Matthew 6, 21? Jesus said, lay not for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and thieves do not break through and steal. For here's what he says. For where your heart is, there's where your treasure is going to be also, right? For where your heart is, there's where your treasure is going to be also, right? Wrong, wrong, wrong. It's not what it says. I purposely misquoted it for you. Jesus doesn't say where your heart is, there's where your treasure is going to be. He says where your treasure is, there's where your heart's going to be. You see, whatever you put your treasure in, whatever you put your time in, listen, you put your time in your family, your heart's going to be there. You put your time in your marriage, your heart's going to be there. You put your time in your relationships, your heart's going to be there. You put your time in the kingdom of God, Are you with me? Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Have you ever put your treasure somewhere and your heart was there? Have you ever bought stock? When you buy stock, what do you do? What's my stock doing? (laughs) Years ago, John and I were talking. I bought bought the stock. I bought the options. Never buy options. (laughs) Options expire. Stock doesn't. Bought some options in a, in, in, a, in a company called SGI, Silicon Graphics. John, how old were you? About 10 years old? About 10 years old, I bought this stock in Silicon Graphics. And the moment I bought it, man, we started watching it. It's Silicon Graphics coming up. It's, it, it's, it, and, and, and we were just glued to it because we were, try, we were hoping it would come. Well, it never did come up to where we, and we lost everything. How many of you know I was grieved? I was grieved because there's where my treasure was, and my heart was there. And because my treasure was there, my heart was there. I I, I run across Christians all the time and say, Pastor, I just want to fall in love more with Jesus. I take a look at people around me, and they just love Jesus more than I do. They worship more than I do. They 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 read more. They they just they just they're they're just more on fire than I am, Pastor. I want to get back to my first love. And, And and one of the things I say, why don't you why don't you try giving more? Do you tithe? Yeah, I give 10%. Why don't you try giving 20%? Well, I don't want to love Jesus that much. (laughs) Oh, Lord, help us. Let's move on. So somebody say develop a generous heart. Deal with a grieving heart. And deal with a selfish heart. Finally, number four, here we are. Develop a grateful heart. Verse 15. Verse 15 says, thou shalt remember that, what? Thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. And the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore, I command thee this thing today. What is he saying? He's saying, hey, remember where you came from. Remember where I brought you from. Remember where it is that God has brought you to. It'll help you be a great giver. Here, let me give you a key. Gratitude produces generosity. Let me say it again. Gratitude produces generosity. You ever heard, heard about the lady? Remember the lady who, who came to Jesus? She had this alabaster box. Remember that story? Come on, give me five more minutes. I'm done. 
This lady come to Jesus. She had this alabaster box. She broke it upon Jesus. She anointed his feet. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that the disciples, Judas, took a look at it, and he said, this was worth 300 denarii. Wow. 300 denarii. Did you hear that? 300 denarii. Doesn't that just freak you out? 300 denarii. Oh, I forgot. You don't know what a denarii is. <laughs> Here's a denarii. A denarii was a day's wages. So when she broke open that box and poured it out upon Jesus, it was worth 300 days wages. Wow. That was worth 10 months wages. That's a lot of money. Come on. Now, why did she so lavishly pour out upon Jesus? Well, let me tell you. Two months before, she came to Jesus. And she said, where were you? If you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You abandoned us. You forgot us. You forsook us. You didn't listen. We called you. We, we, we sent messengers to come and have you come. He was sick. He's died. He, we, we, we buried him three days ago. Where were you? And Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were to die, yet shall he live. He went and stood outside that tomb, and he, and, and he said, Lazarus! Lazarus, come out here, boy! Lazarus came out with his grave clothes on. Now, it's two, two months later. Why is she pouring out the alabaster box upon him? Because she remembers what Jesus did for her. She remembers that she was grieving, but now she's got joy. She remembers that she had felt forsaken, but she knows that God is for her. And of God before her, who can be against her? He'll never leave her nor forsake her, but he'll be with her always. She thought that she was abandoned, but she now knows that she's a child of God. You see, she was once over here, but now she's over here. And as she's over here, she remembers where she was, and she says, Thank you, Jesus. I was bound, I was broken, I was blinded, I was in darkness, I was in chains, I was a mess. And Lord, you came into my life and you changed me. Oh, thank God. It doesn't, it, it's, it's nothing for me to give everything I have when I think of where I was. And where Jesus brought me from and where I am today. You weren't always a CEO. You weren't always Mr. President. You weren't always the owner of your own business. People didn't always look at you and salute you when you walked in the room. People didn't always play the music when you came in. But there was a time when you had nothing. And you didn't have two nickels to rub together. And nobody would give you a job and nobody would give you an interview and nobody would give you a chance. And you called upon the name of the Lord and God began to bless everything you set your hand to do. And now we look at you and we say, oh, there goes sister so-and-so. There goes brother so-and-so. He's a man of God. He's anointed. His family is blessed and his, 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 his company is blessed. Oh, he gives more than anybody else I know. Some people would judge them, and yet they don't know where he came from. And the reason he's giving, as, as much as he's giving, is because he remembers, remembers where he was. Just like Esther, I was nothing but an orphan when Jesus found me. And I had nothing to give him. And he gave me his grace, and he gave me his mercy. And he gave me his love and he changed my life. Therefore, God, whatever it is you want. How, how can that guy, how can that preacher, how can he give God all of his income? How can he give away all those cars? How can he give away his house? How can, because he remembers where he came from. And because he remembers where he came from. And that everything he has came from him anyway. And he says, God, everything I have is yours. It doesn't matter. Lord, help me. Deal with my selfish heart. 
God, may I never grieve over what I've returned to you because it wasn't mine anyway. And Father God, I pray that in this church, I pray that in my own life, that Father, you would develop a generous heart. And Father God, a grateful heart that we would never forget where you brought us from.